The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is Dr. Lauren Levine. I'm your moderator and host for this evening. I wanted to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. You know, any time that we do a topic that we've done in the past or bring back a speaker that we've had in the past, we really never know uh, what type of turnout we're going to get. Um, you know, we've normally been averaging somewhere around 300 or so registrations per webinar for, for most of our clinical webinars. And obviously those of you in the past who have heard uh, Dr. Kaczynski speak uh, wanted to hear him again. He, we, we had close to 850 people that were registered, which is a, a huge number, and uh, a lot of people are logging in right now. I'm only going to speak for a couple of minutes. I want to make sure that, that Tim can speak for as long as he needs. We also want to make sure that we leave time for questions and answers at the end. Now, Many of you have been on webinars in the past. The format is going to be very similar, but for those of you who maybe haven't been on in a while, this is your first time, you have a GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. Now, we don't take verbal questions, obviously. We can't have hundreds of people talking at once. Uh, but if you type in your questions as you think of them, uh, we typically will get to those in the order that they're received at the end. So if you see something on a slide or just want, you know, something that triggers your, your thought process, go ahead and type in the question. We'll make sure that we get to that uh, as well. When you log out this evening, uh, if you want to know anything more about uh, one of the products we're talking about tonight, which is Physics Forceps, uh, about uh, you know Golden Dental Solutions, just indicate that on the survey that you would be interested in hearing from them. I will make sure that they get that information as well. Uh, also, for those of you who are joining us live this evening, we, we certainly do get a number of people that watch it recorded, which we can talk about in a second. But if you're watching it live, you will be eligible for AGD Pay CE. Uh, our sponsor tonight, Golden Dental Solutions, will be sending that out. I do ask for people to be patient with that. It normally takes a couple of weeks. When you have hundreds and hundreds of uh, CE forms to send out, it, it definitely takes some time. Speaking about recording, we do record every one of these webinars. So in case you get distracted or can't stay towards the end, don't worry. Uh, that link will actually probably go out sometime this evening, uh, tomorrow at the latest. I'll make sure that's the entire audio and video recording. So it will be as if you watch the, the whole thing. So don't worry if, if you can't make it to the end. Uh, we'll, we'll take care of that. Now, as I had said initially, uh, you know, to reintroduce myself, my name is uh, Lauren Levine. Many of you know me as a digital dentist. We've been doing these webinars for about five years now, and we've been presenting clinical topics mostly. Um, you know, many of you know me as a, as a technology consultant, and while some of the webinars hit on that uh, subject area, I think the clinical is a, is a lot more interesting. It tends to be very interesting and stimulating, and sometimes there's some controversial topics there, and that's great, you know, because from my standpoint, if you get through the webinar and got two or three little pearls or nuggets of information that you said, hey, I didn't know that, or I think that could that can be beneficial in my practice, um, then in my mind, it was worthwhile. Um, so, of course, the question is, why are we here tonight? You know, because um, in the past, we, we've talked about the fact that few dentists have provided, you know, certain types of treatment to their patients. Uh, you know, things like ortho, for example. Most of us don't treat our own ortho. Um, but the fact is, is that most patients, if given a choice, would prefer that the general dentist provide as many services as possible. Um, the thing is, with proper case selection and training, really any dentist can provide, you know, extractions are basic things that we all learned in, in dental school. So it's really not all that difficult to do that. But of course, there are techniques, there, there are different types of forceps out there, which we'll be talking about, that make life a lot easier. There's grafting techniques that you need to know about. But as long as you get the training and the information that you need, um, I think you're going to be uh, you're going to be okay. Now, as much as I would love to talk about this topic, you know, I did practice perio for ten years. The fact is that when it comes to extractions, the vast majority of the teeth that I pulled out uh, were with my fingers. Uh, I just really did not need forceps. Uh, they were all periodontally involved for the most part. Uh, but uh, the good news is that we've got someone with us this evening. Um, who really is an expert in, in that field, and that's Dr. Tim Kaczynski. Um, he's the adjunct assistant professor at University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. He serves on the editorial review board of Reality, um, Contemporary Aesthetics and Clinical Advisors. He became the editor of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He received his dental degree from University of Detroit and a mastership in biochemistry from Wayne State University. 
He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry, International Congress, Congress of Oral Implantologists, American Society of Osteointegration. In other words, when it comes to implants, he, he knows a thing or two. He's, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. He got his mastership in the uh, AGD. He's received many honors, including fellowship in the American and International College of Dentists, the Academy of Dentistry International. He's a member of OKU and the Pierre Fouchard Academy. Uh, he was the University of Detroit uh, Dentistry Alumni Association's Alumnus of the Year a few years ago. Got the AGD's uh, Lifelong Learning and Service Recognition. He's got just dozens and dozens of articles, probably 70, 80 articles or so that he's published on surgical and prosthetic phases of implant dentistry. He's contributed to a number of textbooks, such as Principles and Practice of Implant Dentistry um, and Dental Implantation and Technology. Uh, any of you that are familiar with the Noble BioCare's Noble Vision series are familiar with Dr. Kaczynski because he was on that as well. So I think at this point, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Tim. And I know, Tim, it's pretty hot up where you are, but uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, you've got the AC on and uh, we're looking forward to tonight's presentation. Lord, we have snow on the ground, and it's about 27 degrees, so very funny. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you for having me again. I, I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, many many people have, have seen this program, and, and um, I've kind of taken the approach in, in education to to kind of do a step-by-step -step analysis of, of what we actually do. But more importantly, what I want to demonstrate today is what, what I do. There's a myriad ways of, of treating patients and removing teeth and grafting areas. And so, There's so many implants out there. But what I want to do is focus on what I do and what works in my hands. So we're going to try to simplify the, the, the program a little bit so that um, so our audience can really feel um, uh, stimulated and maybe comfortable enough to, to get started. Um, as I said, um, uh, you know, the, the, the title here is Practical Extraction and Grafting um, Techniques. Uh, we do a lot of dental implants in our practice, and so atraumatic extractions are, are a very, very important part of my uh, practice. Being able to maintain bone is, is gold to me, and, and trying to keep uh, bone intact makes my final uh, implant surgery that much easier. But I'm also very concerned uh, or involved with the prosthetic design. And, and I'm a truly believer as a general dentist that implants are prosthetically driven. Um, the, the surgery has become um, um, fairly, um, I don't want to use the word simple, but um, re uh, repetitive, predictable maybe is the word, uh, with the techniques and the materials that we have. So. Our objectives today, or tonight for the next 50 minutes or so and in questions, is to learn some um, instrumentation and techniques that provide uh, really good solutions um, as far as being able to achieve atraumatic extractions. And again, I'm using the term atraumatic extractions, um, not loosely, but very specifically. It's atraumatic to the bone. Uh, maintaining the bone is very important to me, as I've already said, but also atraumatic to the patient which is a brilliant marketing strategy for dentists out there. If we can have our patients uh, have a, a positive experience in something that can be very stressful, losing a tooth, uh, if you can imagine, when I, don't, I haven't lost any teeth other than my wisdom teeth, but losing a tooth is, is, can be very, very uh, emotional. Um, and if we can eliminate that negative feeling with an extraction, it's, it's certainly a huge practice builder for, for many of our dentists out there. Um, along with um, removing teeth atraumatically, I think it's imperative that the dentist learn at least simple socket preservation techniques, bone grafting techniques. And we'll, we'll touch on the different materials that I use and the techniques that I use uh, to make this procedure simple and, and not so mysterious um, for those of us who, who aren't uh, practicing atraumatic extractions and socket preservation. And we'll, we'll show some of the grafting techniques and some of the, the the um, procedures that I think are imperative to success. Um, we teach this program, and I get emails every day from doctors and um, concerning their concerns and their issues and their problems with the technique. So we're going to give some specific rules, and I know dentists love specific rules, to make the grafting techniques extremely predictable. We can grow bone today, Lauren. We can certainly grow bone very, very predictably and quite simply as long as we follow the physiologic principles that, uh, that we'll demonstrate today. 
Um, we have to understand why traumatic extractions are important. I mentioned um, having the patient have a good experience, maintaining the bone, maintaining good quality of bone. And um, we'll talk about socket preservation and, and graft in, in, in detail, in, in as much detail as we can in the next hour, and, and how and why this is important to our, our general practitioners out there. And as I mentioned, we place a lot of dental implants. We're in the city of Detroit, and um, you know our economy is, has, has hit as hard as anybody in the country, and yet we've, we've demonstrated um, incredible success because we're able to provide an excellent service for our patients at a, at a fair and reasonable price, and um, we're, that keeps us very, very busy. So for those in our audience who, who may not be placing implants, hopefully we're going to, to uh, plant a seed uh, to motivate you to, to get more involved and to consider uh, programs that, that we have in teaching dental implants, but certainly um, extractions in teaching you a technique that is going to be, um, that's, that's going to save your hands and your, your muscles and your, your, your body and make procedures that may be stressful for you uh, on a daily basis, something that is enjoyable and very profitable for you in the long run. And along with the extractions, obviously, we're going to talk about grafting because I think it is imperative um, that we try to maintain bone. We all know that if we um, lose teeth, bone is going to shrink to some degree, down or up and, and in. And this can make uh, placing implants in the future very difficult. So as I said, I'm going to try to be very practical and just show you the things that work for me. There's a lot of speakers out there. There's a lot of different materials out there. There's a lot of products out there. But I can only demonstrate what works well for me, what I have great success with. And we'll, we'll talk about what's important, you know, is the, we'll, we'll demonstrate that what's important is the clinical results, prosthetically driven, maintaining the quality of bone that we have and the quantity of bone that we have. And things are changing fast. And I believe in comprehensive dentistry and your patients want um, the dentists, our dentists out there to be comprehensive. And the more techniques that you can have in your, your, your bag of tricks, the better off you are. Your patients want to stay with you and whenever possible. And hopefully we're, we're going to demonstrate that and we're going to leave you with some positive feelings about the future of, of dentistry and your practices. Well, here's some slides. These are my patients in my practice. We're in the suburbs of Detroit, a fairly affluent area. But these are real, real patients that come to my office. Now, how can this be? How can these patients um, in the suburbs of, of a metropolitan area um, walk around like this? Well, there's, there's a number of reasons, right? There, there are uh, fear reasons. Maybe they had a bad experience in the past. Uh, it could be financial reasons. Maybe they, they invested in their family, their kids. I've had many, many adult patients who say, you know, I took care of my family and my kids, and now it's my turn to take care of my mouth. Um, and so trying to provide our patients with a positive experience, uh, both emotionally and physically, is an important part of my practice. Uh, and it's an important part of promoting your practice. Um, I don't advertise. I mean, we have a website. Um, but um, certainly, if you're able to provide good quality care to your patients, they are going to tell their family and friends, especially if they have a positive experience, how wonderful you are, and that's how our practice has grown, by word of mouth. Um, we often see this, right? Teeth are removed and uh, bone will shrink down and in, which can make our placement of dental implants um, precarious. For those of you who are, are maybe doing implants, maybe this is a case that you wouldn't want to do because we've lost a significant amount of facial bone. So I think it's very nice if I can teach you or you can learn a technique to build this bone out. And I, I can honestly tell you that, that the general dentists out there, if we follow the, the, the procedures that we're going to demonstrate, we can grow bone predictably today. It's not, it's not magic. It's just a technique, a procedure that we can train you to do and make you very, very successful in, in uh, implant dentistry and in grafting procedures. Again, um, this is very common. Teeth are lost. The bone shrinks in. Um, and in this situation, uh, very uniquely, is the mucogingival line. The mucosa is actually almost on the crest of the ridge. When we're placing dental implants, when we're restoring dental implants, it's imperative that we have attached gingiva. Lauren, you're a periodontist. You know that. With attached gingiva, we'll have health. Without attached gingiva, we'll have something that, that can cause our implant to fail in the future or 
to make it uncomfortable for the patient. It bleeds when you're brushing. It, it, um, it hurts when you're rubbing on it. So it's important that we learn proper techniques and proper maintenance of the gingival tissue to, uh, to excel at what we're doing. And again, it's not a magical procedure. It's just a technique that we can demonstrate. So all of you out there, all the general dentists out there, there's a huge potential for your practice in extractions and grafting. Not only that, but I think it's imperative um, as far as, a, um, as what you're able to, to provide your patients. Um, I, I think, obviously, extractions are important, but being able to fill that socket with something and know that you're going to get a quality result is very, very important. We can do this with the right training. So let's, uh, let's go through some things. You know, clinically, we, I think that's what we want to see is uh, atraumatic extractions. And one of the instruments that I can honestly tell you, and I say this very honestly and very sincerely and very humbly, is I would not practice without this, this tool. The Physics Forcep is an outstanding instrument that has uh, allowed me to remove teeth atraumatically, meaning maintaining the facial bone. Uh, but also atraumatically for the patient, where the patients oftentimes will look me in the eye and say, you're kidding, you're done. Today, we did, we did um, two hybrid cases, and we extracted, um, I think, about 17, 18 teeth. And uh, it's just an amazing experience. I called the patient just before we got online here, and she says, you know, Dr. K, I'm, I'm just amazed. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. Um, and when we're able to do these procedures for our patients, um, it's a wonderful experience, and it's a, it's a practice builder for you. So physics forceps, what are, what are they? How do they work? Well, they're a very unique tool um, that is used to, to elevate teeth out of the socket. And let's, let's go through a case. I think that's probably the easiest way to discuss um, the use of the physics forceps. We have a patient that had an upper right crown. Uh, it's not a bad crown, um, maybe it's not the most aesthetic, but it's been there a long time. And uh, we developed some problems, some, some, some periodontal and some bone problems around this tooth. Um, you can see the purplish tissue, um, obviously something's going on with this tooth. And it was deemed that it was non-restorable. Um, we sent the patient back to our endodontist uh, within our building, and they deemed that um, there's a fracture or something in the tooth that would not allow us to, to just replace it. So let's look at the physics force up. It's a uniquely shaped instrument. There's four instruments, and we'll describe that in a little bit. Um, and it has two components to it. The working end of the instrument is called the beak. And the beak is actually engaged onto the palatal or lingual surface of the tooth. And I'd like to get it one to three millimeters subgingival. So I'd like to get it onto the root structure if possible. That is the working end of the instrument. The bumper, and it's, you can see it in the upper left corner here, uh, has a little silicone um, um, bumper, a little silicone piece that sits onto the, in, the metal instrument itself that is engaged as high up the vestibule or as far down low in the vestibule and the lower jaw as possible. The bumper does nothing for the extraction of the instrument. It's not holding the facial bone. All it is is acting as a fulcrum point for the beak. The beak is the working end of the instrument. And you can see that this instrument is shaped rather uniquely. It's kind of arched. And this allows us to hold the handles very lightly. We're never squeezing the instrument. Rather, we're holding the handles and rotating our wrist in this situation, I'm rotating my wrist towards the uh, tip of the nose and allowing the beak to create tension onto the palatal surface of this tooth. So the, the beak is actually creating tension. This tension results in a physiologic response of the body to create an enzyme called hyaluronidase, so hyaluronic acid. And this enzyme is actually breaking down the periodontal ligament. Well, what's holding a tooth in place? The periodontal ligament. What's a ligament? A ligament is an attachment. And for those athletes out there, uh, we know that knees have ligaments. And if you stretch a ligament, it's not a, band -aid, uh, it's not a rubber band. It doesn't go back. It's stretched. 
And so the only way to fix a stretched ligament is either to surgically um, um, shorten it or to build the muscle around that ligament to strengthen the, the, the limb that we're, we're concerned with. So what's happening with this, with this physics forcep is the beak is creating tension onto the periodontal ligament, and the body's response is to create an enzyme which breaks down the periodontal ligament, allowing the tooth to actually disengage from the socket. Some of our older doctors, I know in some practices that I've been in, will um, uh, traditionally will take a periotome and will cut the periodontal ligament. Uh, or will take an elevator and very, very lightly elevate, elevate, elevate over a long period of time. Well, it's kind of a similar situation where creating tension and breaking down that periodontal ligament, allowing us to remove the tooth um, from the socket. So in my hands, I don't elevate ahead of time. I don't take an elevator. I don't take a uh, periotome to break down or cut the periodontal ligament. I never elevate against another tooth. And the instrument itself acts as the instrument of removal. I'm rotating my wrist. Again, in this situation, I'm rotating my wrist towards the, towards the um, uh, uh, tip of the nose. And the, the beak is engaging the palatal surface here. And the tension is actually that same elliptical motion that the instrument is shaped like. It, it's rounded. We keep pressure on it, but not squeezing. Our muscle memory with our traditional uh, forceps, we want to squeeze. How would we remove this tooth with a conventional forceps? We would grab it. We would squeeze it. We would rotate it uh, mesial distal. We would rotate it buccal lingual. We would rotate it in a figure eight motion. And we would force that tooth out of the socket, which often causes damage to the bone or damage to the root of the tooth. We've all been there, right? We, we have an extraction, and we break the root tip, and we spend the next half an hour trying to remove a tiny root tip. I see it all the time. I see a lot of root tips left in the mouth. With this instrument, that is very, very rare um, to, to damage it because, again, it's all physiologic. The enzymatic action is breaking down the periodontal ligament. So here I'm rotating my wrist towards the tip of the nose, and what will happen over a period of minutes is the periodontal ligament will be broken down by the enzyme, and the tooth will actually start to pop. We don't hear a pop, but rather it disengages. And in a, in a two-dimensional photograph, it's hard to see, but the tooth is not coming out the facial. It's coming up and out of the socket. So it's being lifted up as well as towards the facial aspect. The tooth is not intended to remove the tooth in in total. Rather, it's intended to pop the tooth out of the socket um, to disengage the periodontal ligament. I will then take what we call a tooth delivery instrument, a bird beak um, kind of uh, forcep, and we will simply rotate that tooth back and forth, and the tooth will come out of the socket. This is a very important slide, everybody. Um, number one, we did no damage to the adjacent teeth. Number two, in implant dentistry, the aesthetic zone is critical to me, as it was to you, Lauren. Working in the aesthetic zone is, is a challenge. So what's important in the aesthetic zone? The interdental papilla. The papilla is not blunted or damaged. And what's holding that interdental papilla in place? The interceptal bone. We didn't damage the interceptal bone. We did no damage to the facial uh, plate of bone. So I simply have a cereal bowl. I have an ice cream cone, so to speak, of a socket, which makes it very easy for me to treat either by grafting it with some type of material we'll talk about in a few minutes or eventually a dental implant if that's what we, we provide uh, our patients. So we, we were able to remove a tooth very atraumatically in a matter of minutes with no force to the patient. The patients are just so amazed on how simple the procedure is. It, you're not putting your chest on their, on their, you're not putting your knee on their chest to try to remove the tooth, and it takes no strength because I've never squeezed the instrument. There's no uh, forearm, there's no bicep, there's no shoulder pressure whatsoever. Rather, it's just um, tension placed by the beak onto the palo aspect of the tooth, disengaging that tooth from the socket by simply enzymatically breaking down the periodontal ligament. It really is magic. 
So we're able to remove the tooth very atraumatically, and we have a socket that uh, is clean and very easy to work with. So what are the, the, uh, the physics four steps? Well, the standard series consists of four instruments, and, and you need all four. Um, the, the four instruments, there's three instruments that are used in the, in, the, in the maxilla and one instrument that's used in the mandible. So we have an upper right physics forcep, an upper anterior and upper left physics forcep, and a universal uh, mandibular physics forcep. And they're all shaped just a little bit differently to allow access to the palatal or lingual surface of the tooth and allows you to rotate your wrist and create that tension and remove the teeth from the socket very predictably. There are bumper guards that are, are um, uh, silicone in material, and that's just a cushion. Uh, they're disposable. They're very inexpensive um, and um, uh, very easy to slide in and out. I, I don't, we don't use those over. We don't sterilize them or anything. Um, and it just makes it a little more comfortable. But the bumper, remember, is not doing any of the work. All it's doing is acting as a fulcrum um, for, the, for the beak. Now, in some situations, the, the uh, vestibule may be very shallow, or sometimes the, the lingual surface or palatal surface of the tooth is very decayed or broken down, and yet the facial surface of the tooth may be um, uh, usable. So uh, Golden um, Dental Solutions created their molar series, which is a, just two instruments. Uh, the concept is, is exactly the same. We have a beak and a bumper. But the position of the, the offset of the handles allow you to use it in areas that may be difficult to use with the standard series. And we'll demonstrate that in, in just a few, few moments. They also have a pedodontic series, uh, which are one-third smaller, exactly the same instrument, but one-third smaller than the standard series. For those of you who um, do a lot of, of uh, children or, or uh, pedodontic extractions, you may want to consider this smaller um, set of instruments um, to use. Buckle bones. I've said several times now that that facial bone is gold to me. Why is it important to me? Well, if I can maintain the facial bone, I basically have a, a cereal bowl. And that cereal bowl I can pretty much fill with anything meaning the graph material, quite readily. I can put cornflakes or cocoa puffs or, or um, count chocula, which I just had this week, which were delicious, by the way. Um, and it, it allows us to very predictably um, simply graft the site and prevent that shrinkage of bone that we hate to see, whether we're doing implants or whether we're doing conventional dentistry. Sometimes um, the 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 physics forcep beak is shaped like a shovel. And some teeth are more elliptical or rounded, and that beak will want to slide off the instrument. So what we do sometimes, if you find that the beak is, is sliding off of the, the, the palatal or lingual surface of the tooth, I'll simply take a burr and flatten the palatal or lingual root. I'm not troughing the bone. Rather, I'm holding the burr onto the tooth just to get a flattened plane so that I can engage my beak onto that surface so it doesn't rotate off. So here we have a molar tooth that we need to remove, and uh, I'm flattening the, the palatal root structure, which allows me to uh, engage the uh, beak and bumper and remove the tooth quite easily. Lower teeth, um, um, lower molar teeth, um, often have divergent roots. And using the physics forcep where you have uh, divergent roots can be difficult, if not impossible. And the reason is the, the, the um, um, design of that tooth is not going to allow you to simply remove it in one direction. So if that's the case, what we'll do is we'll section the tooth. And here's a, a molar tooth that uh, there's not a lot to grab onto. And I'll just take a a surgical burr, a 557L, uh, a long surgical burr, and I will cut the tooth in half through the furcation. It's important that you take a radiograph to make sure that you're through the furcation completely. When you're able to do that, uh, as you can see here, um, we can simply use the physics forcep by engaging the beak onto the palatal, onto the lingual surface of this tooth, and removing the mesial and distal root as two separate teeth, as if they were two uh, simple bicuspid teeth. It becomes a very simple procedure. 
we don't want to we don't want to elevate against an implant or an implant crown um, and possibly create damage to the implant itself or to the porcelain um, on that crown. So here we're using the the physics forcep to engage the lingual surface of one of the roots, the mesial root, placing the bumper deep down into the vestibule and then rotating towards the right shoulder. I'm simply rotating my wrist, no forearm, no bicep, no shoulder, and rotating my wrist, and in a matter of seconds, this root will come out and out of the socket. Again, it's not coming out buckly, rather it's coming up or uh, up and out of the socket. We're able to remove the tooth as if it were bicuspid. Now look how bad that, that distal root is. And if we're able to engage the, the beak onto this tooth and rotate our wrist again towards the shoulder, we can get that second socket up very, very traumatically, creating um, um, a cereal bowl that we're able to fill quite readily with whatever material we, we deem appropriate. Let's go to grafting. So um, when, we're, when we're looking at, at grafting procedures uh, for general dentists out there, um, I, I strongly believe that it's a procedure that can be taught and can be very predictable. Um, I think it's important that you realize your limitations in that if we have um, a defect where all four walls are intact, meaning the mesial, distal, lingual, and uh, facial walls are all intact, we can easily place a material in there and the material is not going to go anywhere. When we lose one of the walls, and in our cases the wall that we would lose most readily is the facial wall, we have to de determine how do we repair that. And I'm telling you we can repair that quite readily, but it means making a flap um, into the, the tissue so that we can see the defect. And it also it's very important that we use a membrane. We have to realize that tissue grows significantly faster than bone. Some say 10 times faster than bone. And we have to protect our grafting material from invagination of the epithelial tissue. And in so doing, we will use what we call a membrane or a barrier. And this will prevent the, t the epithelium from ingrowing into the uh, grafted site and allow the body to heal and replace the particles with natural bone. So it's important that you know your limitations. If you have more than two walls that are missing, then I think that is, that is a case for our oral surgeon or periodontist colleagues uh, to do because that's their training. So know where you are, know what you can use, and uh, we, can, we can very predictably treat our patients. So what are the type of grafting materials? We need to know the different types, and there's basically four types. Autogenous bone is the patient's own bone. It's from their body, and it's the gold standard. Um, it's osteogenic, it, it's osteoconductive, it's osteoinductive, it has all the, all the chemistry um, that will allow a, a bone growth. It's similar to a broken arm. If you break your arm, you're in a cast for six weeks, and the body cells, the osteoclasts will eat away the bone in the damaged area, and then osteoblasts will lay down new bone, which is actually stronger than the, the original bone. Allograft material is bone from another human, uh, cadaver bone. Um, there are only a few sites um, nationally that are now harvesting bone. It's a very safe and predictable method. Um, the concerns that we had in the past are really not legitimate anymore uh, with the FDA control of the, of the preparation of the bone. Um, but it's something that, that we use all the time. Xenograft is bone from another species, for instance, uh, bovine or, or pig or um, horse or any other kind of uh, animal um, that, will, uh, that is not human, another species. I don't really use xenografts. Probably the most popular one um, was the bovine one. And um, I found that in my hands, uh, it was not really, really predictable for placing the implant in the future. So it's something that I don't really use. But I do use a lot of alloplastic material, which are basically synthetic materials. And there's a lot of different brands and types out there. But the material that I use is called uh, tricalcium phosphate. Uh, tricalcium phosphate has been around for a long time. It's been popular for probably 10 years. And I find it to be a very useful uh, um, uh, tool in my practice in that we do have patients for a number of reasons, whether it be religious um, or other reasons, um, do not want to use bone from another human source. 
So I do use a lot of alloplastic material, the beta tricalcium phosphate that we'll discuss in a few moments. Let's keep it simple. Um, there's a lot out there, and it can get very confusing and overwhelming, so let's not do that. Um, I use two types of allograft materials. Allograft, human bone. I'll use a powder material, and it's usually 500 to 1,000 microns is the size particle I like. And I will mix that with sterile saline or sterile water, and it will form into a gel. And I will then carry it to my site and pack the material. Pack meaning place it into the socket and gently tap it into place. We don't pack it like amalgam or anything like that. We don't want to crush the particles. A simpler solution is to use what we call a putty. And a putty is simply a delivery system where we have our allograft, our human bone particles in a, in a collagen gel, which allows us to syringe the material into a socket. It's probably the most convenient way of placing bone, but it's also the most expensive way of, of placing bone in a socket. And then I have a synthetic material, uh, the, the serosorb material or the tricalcium phosphate material. Um, and these are all um, these are all materials that that can be um, obtained from golden dental solution. When we graft, we also have to be prepared to use membranes. And I use two two membranes. Um, I use a resorbable membrane, and the one that I like to use is called EpiGuide um, from Curasan and from Golden Dental Solutions. EpiGuide is a trilaminar. Uh, resorbable material that will last up to four months in the mouth. And so I find it very easy to use. I find it very easy to manipulate uh, and to place. <laughs> and so uh, it's a product that I like. In some situations, we want to use a non-resorbable material. Non-resorbable meaning I have to go back and retrieve it at a future date. When would I use a non-resorbable? Well, oftentimes I'll use a non-resorbable when I can't get uh, primary closure um, um, less than two millimeters. So, for instance, a molar tooth, where um, obviously the, the wound is going to be quite open, I'll use a non-resorbable material which protects my graft, uh, my, um, um, my synthetic or my allograftic material uh, from invagination of the soft tissue. And we'll demonstrate that in a few moments. Um, again, we, we talked about this again, but um, Cost is they're very similar. Maybe the alloplastic material is a little bit less expensive, but be conscious of your your patient's needs and desires. And I think you have to tell your patients what you're going to be using in their in their you know in their mouth. Um, it's important. Um, the putty material again is probably the most convenient delivery system. It contains both demineralized cortical and um, a mineralized cancellous bone, and it's very easy to use. It's in a, in a glass syringe, and you can just kind of uh, uh, squirt it into the socket, uh, and it works very, very well. So here is an allograft material uh, powder, and you can see how it, it comes from Gold Os, from the Golden Dental Solutions, and I'll mix it with some sterile saline or sterile water, and it will form a putty-like substance. Here is the, the putty uh, graft. It comes in a syringe. Uh, and it's simply syringed into the socket. Again, very convenient way of delivering bone into a site. And you can see how the, the particles are, are engaged in, a, in a, a cellulose kind of base. The synthetic material I use is the serosorb, uh, a beta tricalcium phosphate. Um, it's osteoconductive, meaning it's, uh, it acts like um, um, stone and concrete and it resorbs efficiently and effectively by the body cells, by the osteoclast, and then osteoblasts will lay down new bone. And it's very biocompatible. I, I use the material all the time. I, I find it to be very predictable as long as we're following the rules and regulations of, of what we need to do. Types of membranes. Which membrane to use? Okay, what's the purpose of a membrane? To allow adequate space for the grafting material. To, to allow for wound closure, uh, especially if you can't get primary closure, uh, to prevent invasion of the epithelial cells, sequester um, platelet-derived growth factors and bone morphogenic proteins. Kind of uh, a socket will heal from the apex up or down, depending on which, which uh, arch you're looking at. And that's how a socket heals. Um, and so we're trying to prevent invagination 
of epithelium and to the crust from the crustal towards the apex. And, and it also helps in clot, uh, contraction. So let's look at resorbable. My favorite resorbable is EpiGuide. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice material, easy to control. The non-resorbable material I use is from Implant Direct. It's called Cytoplast. Again, high quality product, uh, cost effective for us, and, and easy to use. Let's go through some cases. Whew, we're talking a lot here. Um, let's look at a single extraction graft in an implant uh, of an upper canine. We're going to use the Goldoss uh, allografted crunch, crunch putty, and we're going to use the EpiGuide resorbable membrane. This is kind of a cool case. This patient came in uh, as a referral um, for a non-restorable um, maxillary canine tooth that needed to come out, and we were going to create a socket, hopefully a traumatic extraction, and graft it and also place an implant if possible. So this tooth is non-restorable. It's, it's fractured as a post, and we all love posts. And um, so we're going to take our physics forcep, and I was able to remove the tooth atraumatically. Here we, we just put a, a new uh, Botex CT in the office, and I just wanted to demonstrate it. We can actually do quadrants with this, uh, what the tooth looks like. And you have to remember that the, in, the, in the canine eminence, the maxillary canine eminence, the bone is very, very thin in that area. So it's very easy to damage the facial bone in the maxillary canine area. I think we're all aware of that, even with our conventional techniques. So here I'm using the physics forcep, engaging the palo aspect of the, of, the root, of, of the root of the tooth, placing the bumper where? Up into the vestibule, using um, 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 tension onto the palatal surface of this tooth by rotating the wrist, never squeezing the handles, rotating my wrist towards the, say, the corner of the, I guess that would be the right eye, and the tooth will pop. I'll take my tooth delivery instrument, and I'm able to remove this tooth atraumatically. What does that mean? Number one, the patient was apprehensive. I had just met this patient, um, and we were able to remove the tooth with very limited, limited stress to them. And atraumatically, meaning I was able to maintain the facial plate of bone miraculously. Any, uh, any semblance of interdental papilla was maintained. The intercephal bone was maintained, and we, we were able to remove the tooth. Now, do you believe me? Well, I went back and I did another CT. Look how thin that facial bone was. That facial bone is intact, and we have a nice socket site uh, to be able to place, to graft and place an implant into that site. So we're able to very, very predictably remove teeth without damaging the facial bone. Here's the periapical of the same. We use the crunch putty from Goldoss. We squirt it into the site after I um, did my osteotomy. Now, the osteotomy, meaning uh, the, the making the opening for the implant, is not in the socket. I go parallel to the socket. Um, without getting into too much detail, I want to be about three millimeters uh, palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth. When we do this, I, I elevated the facial tissues to show you that that, that facial bone was indeed intact. Um, and it was maintained very predictably using these innovative physics forceps, which are ju just remarkable to me. When we graft, we need to place a membrane. But the membrane has to be placed in a specific way. We have to engage the membrane onto at minimum of two millimeters of bone, of living bone. We can't just put the membrane on top of the socket and expect it to work. The membrane has to be maintained for a period of time to allow the physiologic response of our, our body cells to form new bone. We have to protect what we've done. So here, I did elevate the facial tissue like an envelope. I didn't, I didn't do a vertical incision. I just kind of pulled the tissue away, kept the, kept the attached gingiva intact, and I was able to tuck my membrane onto at minimum of two millimeters of that facial bone. I'm taking my crunch putty, very, very easy delivery system, as you can see. I'm actually just syringing it right into the site. And then after I've already done my osteotomy, I'm going to take my implant and simply thread it into position, carry the membrane over to the palatal surface um, of, the, of the socket, 
again, engaging minimum of two millimeters. This membrane isn't going to go anywhere in a period of time. It's just not going to. It's not going to move. Probably the biggest mistake or biggest concern that I get when I get emails is, Dr. Kaczynski, I did what you said, but when I took the stitches out in a week, the membrane came out with it. Now, what's going to happen? Well, I don't know. If the membrane is gone in a week, the, the, the case becomes unpredictable. Not that it won't work, but it may not work. And there's nothing more frustrating to do this expensive dentistry um, and have something not work. So we want you to be predictable. So we're suturing the site. I'm going from the socket site to the facial so that I'm not engaging my membrane at all. I'm going from the socket site to the palatal so that I'm not engaging the membrane at all. And we did closure. Now you can see I don't have primary closure there. But I don't want primary closure. I want attached gingiva to stay on the facial aspect of the tooth. I don't want to pull that, that tissue all the way to the palatal and have mucosa on the facial aspect of that implant. Here we did a post-operative radiograph. The implant is engaged palatally in solid bone, and the, any defect was corrected using our, our crunch putty. Lower molar. Now, some of the things that we use um, that Golden Dental Solutions provides us are just remarkable tools. Um, we have a crown. How do you remove your crowns now? Well, normally most of us will take a, a burr and we'll cut the crown in half and we'll take an elevator or something and dislodge it and, and take the crown off. Well, that's fine, um, but oftentimes we want to, we're removing crowns with the idea that we're going to make a new crown. We never replace our own crowns. We're always replacing other people's crowns, but um, this technique using the WAM key provided by Golden Dental Solutions is, is a pretty cool technique to remove crowns if you haven't seen it. Uh, it's a series of three instruments, and what we're doing is we're going to measure um, from the facial aspect to, to the, to the um, central groove area. We're kind of guesstimating where we think that preparation, um, the occlusal preparation will be. But what I'm doing is I'm taking a, um, a burr, and I'm making a circular or elliptical opening in the facial aspect of the tooth. I'm taking my wham key and engaging through the hole of the tooth and removing that crown in one piece. Now this is wonderful because if we were saving the tooth, we could prep and we could use this, this crown as a, as a temporary by putting some composite on the facial aspect. So pretty remarkable uh, tool. But you know what, even, even now with our zirconia crowns, those of you, my goodness, trying to remove a zirconia crown, we go through $40 worth of burrs. And now we can simply make a small uh, elliptical opening in the facial aspect, and Goldoff has some zirconia cutting burrs, and remove these crowns very atraumatically. Now, in this situation, we were removing the tooth because it was non-treatable. Non so again, uh, we're going to section it through the frication, and engage our physics forcep and elevate the tooth out of the socket. Pretty amazing. Our gold off putty can then be used and the same procedure each and every time I, I do this work. We have to be able to place our membrane two millimeters minimally on the facial and two millimeters on the lingual aspect of the socket site to maintain that graft material. If we don't, the site will shrink uh, and or will become very unpredictable. So I'm simply elevating the tissue, lingual and palatal, placing our membrane, and we're able to graft our site, cover over the, the membrane onto the lingual surface so that it doesn't bounce off, suture it in place, and we will grow bone. We will all grow bone. Every one of you will grow bone. The site will be allowed to heal for about four months, and we're able to easily um, place an implant or, or in the future. Um, another extraction of an upper molar. You know, let's go through this, and then Lauren will, will stop, and we'll have some questions for the next 10 minutes or so. so we have a tooth, uh, maxillary first molar, that was deemed non-restorable. Uh, we're going to remove this tooth. How do we remove that tooth? How do you remove that tooth in your practice today? I think you need to ask. Probably take a periotome, probably elevate. Uh, we have weakened teeth on either side. 
You don't want to damage the porcelain. It could be a very difficult extraction of a three-rooted three molar tooth. So here I'm using my innovative physics forcep, engaging the, the tallow surface of the root. You can see I'm not engaging the crown. I'm subgingival. I'm on the root surface, and I'm rotating. And this is a very important photo, Lauren. Um, the tooth is coming up and out of the socket. You can see how it's been elevated out of the socket as well as towards the facial. And look at this. Look at this root that was able to, we were able to remove atraumatically in a matter of minutes without ever touching or damaging the adjacent teeth. Same rules that we have. We're going to curette the site, clean it. I have to elevate. You have to be able to see that lingual and palatal bone. You can't just put the membrane on the, on the top surface and hope that you can tuck it under. That's unpredictable. Take the time, place the membrane correctly. As, we, as you can see here, we have the membrane. It's not going anywhere. I'm not holding it. I'm taking my crunch putty, placing, filling the socket, suturing the site. In one week, I remove the sutures. In one week, I remove the sutures, and this is what the membrane looks like. It, I call it a Band-Aid. It stays there. It didn't come out. It's not going anywhere. In four weeks, the patient will come in, and I will simply remove that membrane with a, um, an explorer. No anesthesia is needed. Now, what's that? That's osteoid. That's not epithelium. You can see we have attached gingiva on the facial. Obviously, there's palatal attached gingiva. What's in the middle is osteoid, which is a bone precursor. The epithelium will grow over that, which will allow the site to heal. And it allows me to immediately place an implant, a flapless procedure. No, you can see there's no bleeding, there's no blood, very predictably. If we didn't do this, if we, didn't, if we took this tooth out and didn't graft it, I like to tell my patients it's like a, a, a circus tent being held by a tent pole. That, that circus tent is being held up by the tent pole, but if you remove the tent pole, if you remove the tooth, the circus tent will fall or the sinus will fall. And those are the predicaments that we're often in as general dentists. We would love to, to replace posterior teeth, but we're not able to because the sinuses are large, because they collapse. So get in the habit of extracting teeth and grafting predictably, and we're able to move on. Um, Lauren, I'm going to stop here so that we can have time for some questions. Um, and I, I think it's an appropriate time. Great. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I hope you weren't planning to cut out of here early because we got a lot of questions. Um, I know that um, before we do that, I want to uh, switch the screen over for a second to, uh, to Kurt from, uh, from Golden Dental. I know that, uh, you know, typically whenever we have someone sponsor the, the webinar, uh, we ask them to put together a, a special, and uh, it must be Thanksgiving soon because it looks like they're in a very giving mood. And uh, at this point, I'm going to turn the uh, the screen and and the mic over to to you, Kurt, and uh, we would love to hear what you have to say. All right, thanks, Laura, and uh, I appreciate it. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining uh, this evening on the webinar. Uh, let me get my slides up here, and we'll get started. All right, so um, I'm just going to quickly go over the, uh, a couple of the products that were discussed this evening as well as the special that you can see on the screen right now. Um, we're going to offer 10% uh, off on anything on the website. Um, that'll work as uh, something as simple as bumper guards for anybody that already has our products, uh, anybody that's looking to maybe uh, try one of the uh, different grafting products, uh, physics forceps, wham key. Um, I know we talked about a lot of things this evening. Um, which I'll go through, um, but the promotional code would be uh, WEB10, so it's W-E-B and then numeric uh, one zero, and that will allow you to uh, obtain 10% off in the shopping cart um, and any of the products available on our website. Um, so it's something we really rarely do. Um, I'm not sure if we've actually ever done that, to be honest, and um, I'd encourage anybody to take advantage of that. So this uh, special will expire uh, this Friday, the 21st. Um, so we'll give you this week to, uh, to take a look um, at the products we discussed this evening. Um, so I just want to go through a couple quick things. And like I said, we'll get to the questions. Uh, but one thing that we have uh, packaged that's quite nice is uh, for anybody out there that's maybe uh, thinking about getting into grafting or isn't grafting as much as they'd like, um, we have a really, really nice kit here called the uh, starter kit. 
And what's great about it is it has the uh, 10 instruments um, that were picked by Dr. Kaczynski as to what, what he uses in his practice. And it has uh, more or less one of each type of the bone products we discussed um, this evening. So you'll get um, a couple different membranes, including the EpiGuide, um, a half cc and a one cc of the allograft bone powder, um, some of the tricalcium phosphate, some of the putty, um, as well as something we actually just um, completed recently is a really, really good uh, two-hour, uh, over two-hour instructional DVD that goes over extractions and really focuses a lot more um, on grafting. So that's also available on the website if anybody's even looking for a refresher with the physics forceps um, or wants to learn uh, a little bit more about the content we discussed this evening. I know we only had a short period of time this evening, but it's discussed um, in much more depth um, on the video, as well as um, having the ability to actually show live video in real time, which is um, pretty neat. So this whole kit is it's actually under $900, which is, is really fair. Um, you get, like I said, a, a bunch of different bone products, a video on how to do it, and the instruments um, that you'd use to do the grafting. So that's something you can learn a little bit more about on our website on goldendentalsolutions.com if you want to take a look. Uh, physics forceps, for anybody that's not familiar with them. Tim's already gone through the, the two sets. Um, I just wanted to mention with any of our Physics Forceps products uh, for the extraction instruments, there's always 90 full days to try them. They don't work for you. You know, they don't work for you. It's very rare that people aren't happy with them, um, but it's something to consider. Uh, the Physics Forceps, uh, we want them to work for you. Um, and if you're not happy with them, you simply uh, would be able to send them back for a full refund. Um, so that's a pretty fair policy we have here. Um, like I said, very few people do send them back, uh, but it is something, um, if you're not quite sure, uh, we would always um, recommend you to give them a try in your own hands. They have to work for you. Um, we didn't get, uh, get to this this evening, but I just want to quickly mention it. For anybody that's placing implants, this is a neat product um, that we just launched earlier this year. It's called the MD Guide. And what it's going to allow you to do is to obtain proper mesial distal spacing as well as to visualize from a parallelism perspective uh, what your final crown your implant is going to look like. Um, it has different sized cylinders um, attached to a pilot drill. So really all it is is an alternative uh, to fabricating a conventional surgical guide. And it's not changing your surgical protocol, the implant system you're using. It's just simply swapping our pilot drill system uh, for the pilot drill that comes in your implant kit. The brand doesn't matter. Um, it's going to work with any type of handpiece. And what it has is it has a 6, 7.5, a, a 9, a 10.5, and, and a 12 cylinder size attached to the pilot drill. And what that's doing is it's replicating the size of the tooth that you're going to be replacing. And it's going to force you to be perfectly in the center from a mesial distal perspective uh, when you're placing implants. And what's neat about it, it has a matching corresponding virtual size tooth, which if you're doing multiple implants on a line, you would use the drilling guide, take it out, replace it with the virtual size tooth, and then continue on down the line, so to speak, where you're going to be able to kind of visualize what you're doing and what your crowns are going to look like. And it's just a really nice little tool um, as you can see here in the animation as to how it's going to work, uh, where the cylinders are going to align and force you to be in the middle. Learn a little bit more about that um, on our website. Uh, if you want to take a look, there's lots of videos. Um, I know we discussed that this evening, but I just wanted to mention it quickly. Lastly, the WAM key, we already showed that, so I'm not going to uh, talk about this too much longer to save time for uh, the Q&A, but if anybody's looking for um, a really nice way to remove a crown. Um, the WAM key is something to take a look at. Works great, too, in the case of a loose bridge. Um, allows you to preserve the bridge for your patient and actually reuse it permanently. Um, there's a 30-day trial period on the WAM key. Um, so the good instructional DVD, it's not, um, not too expensive a product. So last, I just want to mention real quickly, uh, we do offer live patient CE courses in Detroit. Um, we just have one left for this year, which is December 13th. Uh, level one is only going to be extractions. 
Uh, we take out um, several hundred teeth during the day. Um, it's a great experience. Um, they're all in Detroit due to the logistical aspect of um, the live patient treatment, um, but it's well worth your, uh, your time and your, your trip to come here um, because, like I said, you're working on live patients. Uh, there's no licensing restrictions since we do it at the university, and uh, it's a good experience. Uh, level two is more focused on the grafting. Um, we'll have our 2015 dates announced soon. Um, we've done a handful of these courses uh, during this last year successfully. They always sell out. Um, you're going to remove the tooth, and then you're going to get to uh, actually graft the, the, the socket site. And uh, Tim Kaczynski is um, one of the instructors um, at these courses, as well as uh, Dr. R. Nazarian and uh, Dr. Golden. So I'll just show you quickly. Uh, here's the clinic floor with Dr. Krasinski um, demonstrating a procedure um, before you break out into your individual rooms. Um, you'll see here uh, you're more or less just working with one other doctor for the most part. And um, this is just the day one portion or the classroom hands-on portion for the grafting course before we get down to the live uh, patient treatment. And again, just some more clinical images here of our courses. Um, I encourage you to visit the CE section of our website. And uh, I'll just leave the special up. Um, I'll be available for any questions. And I'll turn it back over to Lauren and Tim to go through the uh, questions. And I thank everybody again for their time this evening. Thanks, Kurt. Um, I think what I want to try is kind of pick out some of the questions that, that are for you, and then we'll get to some of the clinical stuff as well. Um, question about, uh, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, when someone attends the course, can they, say, can they keep those extracted teeth, or do they have to stay at the clinic? Um, <laughs> I get, you know, they're actually, um, I guess I, you know, I'd like to know, I guess, why somebody's asking that, I guess. But generally, they do collect the teeth there. I think they provide them to the students for, I don't know if it's for further training um, there at the program for endo. Um, you know, I guess if somebody has that specific question, that's something that um, you know, we'd have to work out or talk to the university about. But they, they do collect them there. I know that. Um, they aren't really disposed of. And what they do with them, I'm not sure. So, uh, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure. But if that person wants to contact us with something specific, then, then you know, go ahead. Okay. Now, if someone can't, if they want to take advantage of the course, um, but, they, you know, it's going to be in 2015, will that promotion still be valid? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's why I didn't, I didn't put an expert. Usually we just kind of have that limited offer for, you know, a week or two. Um, we're, we're pretty fair and flexible on it. If somebody wants to call and just reserve a date, or I mean reserve um, their spot, so to speak, and then when the 2015 dates are available, they can pick one. Uh, but, but yeah, absolutely. Mention they've obtained the, joined the webinar in uh, November, and, and sure, we'll definitely honor that. The, the, the December 13th one coming up is the last one for the year on extractions. Um, we really hope to have our dates finalized here shortly. We're just kind of waiting on the university, unfortunately. Okay. And what's the website? If people want to you know, know more about the products and know more about you know, the things we talked about this evening, what's, what URL should they go to? Yeah, that would probably be a good idea to mention. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's, um, it's goldendentalsolutions.com, uh, and our phone number here is uh, 877-987-2284. Um, so you can search for physicsforceps.com or goldendentalsolutions.com. It's going to take you to the same place. And um, maybe I can just I got out of here for a second. Um, I'll just I'll put it up on the screen while everybody's. You can, you can go on the next question, Lauren. But I'll just okay. Now you had mentioned there's two levels of courses. Do, do they have to take level one before they take level two, or can they do you know can they go right to level two? Or how does that whole process work? Um. No, not, not at all. It's not a precursor to level two by any means. Um, just some people maybe have like zero extraction experience and maybe just want to focus on that first. Um, but even if you still feel like you need some, you know, more training on extractions, you can still just come right into level two. You're obviously still going to be taking the tooth out. Um, you'll still take a lot of teeth out. Um, but you will be, um, it's a little bit of a slower pace where then you'll spend 
a little bit more decent time doing the grafting aspect, where level one is just taking the tooth out and then quickly moving on to the next patient and taking the tooth out again. So they're both extraction courses, but level two is you're going to spend the time doing the grafting also. So no, there's, there's, it's not a requirement to come to one. Um, it just depends on what the doctor is comfortable with. Um, but we'll work at any pace that the doctor wants to work with, and instructors will make sure they have a good experience either way. Okay, now these are just extractions, right? You guys don't have any implant courses right now? Um, Golden Dental Solutions doesn't uh, have a specific um, implant course. I know um, Tim Kaczynski works with the uh, Ingle Institute, uh, which is Dr. Todd Ingle, uh, where it is live patient um, implant programs. And um, if anybody wants information on that, you know, they can contact us too or um, just search for the Ingle Institute. Uh, and, and maybe Tim can speak on that a little bit further um, also. Okay. Lauren, our, our, our Ingle, the Ingle program is done um, three times a year here in Detroit. It's also done in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it's a, a three-day program, a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that the doctors um, get some very intense lecturing. Uh, again, very practical things, typical hands-on model. But what's unique about the program is on the third day, you'll come to my office and you'll place an implant by yourself uh, on one of my patients under direct supervision of Dr. Engel or myself under a very strict protocol. So for those of, those of you out there who really want to learn practical implant dentistry that you'll be able to, to use in your practice the following week after the course, uh, it, it is a wonderful program in engelinstitute.com, E-N-G-E-L, institute.com. And uh, the courses sell out very quickly. Uh, we're doing another another one in a couple of weeks, but I think we already have 16 doctors um, signed up. So um, it, it's a hot topic, but you have to learn it the right way, and you have to learn it on patients. Or it, it's okay. really yeah. important to learn it on patients. I agree. Well, we got about 25 minutes for questions, and I want to start getting to some of these clinical stuff. Because, and I do apologize, we're not going to get to all the questions. We've got about 40 questions here, uh, but I'm going to try to pick out the ones. Some of them are, are somewhat repeated, so I want to make sure that we try to get to as much information as possible. Um, what about uh, impacted teeth? Did the physics forceps work work for those? Well, I mean, that, that's a great question, and and you know, as we were trying to, as I was trying to demonstrate. The, the working end of the instrument is the beak, which engages the palate or lingual surface. So you have to be able to engage the instrument um, onto, onto the root surface of a tooth. So with an impacted tooth, uh, that, that may be difficult. Um, I guess it depends on how impacted it is. Um, in in, in a, a, a similar question that we will get, and you probably will ask me, what about ankylosed teeth? Well, again, the instrument is intended to break down the periodontal ligament. If you don't have a periodontal ligament, the instrument um, you know, doesn't work the way we demonstrated it earlier. So you, you have to you have a tooth that you can, can engage the, the instrument with. Okay. What about the bumpers? Do they traumatize the tissue at all? No. Again, the, the bumper is intended to act only as a fulcrum. It is not a working part of the instrument at all. It's, it's a fulcrum. It's a center point of rotation. And, the, the, and we hear this a lot, but the issue is um, our muscle memory, everything we've learned in dental school and in our practices is to squeeze as hard as we can to disengage the tooth from a socket. And that creates a lot of trauma to the tooth, to the bone, and to the patient. We're not squeezing the instrument. We're not damaging or bruising the facial bone if the instrument is used correctly. We're simply creating tension by the by the beak, which lifts the tooth up and out of the socket. Okay. Now, there's obviously other um, elevators and forceps systems out there. What's the the main difference with the uh, the physics forceps that makes them unique? Well, that's a question that hits home. Um, the physics forcep um, has a patent on the technique. Um, there have been other instruments um, that will engage uh, the tooth that basically uses the, the, um, the patent technique of the physics forcep. And, and Kurt may, may or may not want to address um, that, um, that question. The, the difference is the way the instrument, the way the handles are, are positioned um, allows you to effectively remove a tooth 
very well um, using the standard set of physics forceps, where the other elevators, the uh, other forceps elevators, are much more difficult to remove a tooth. Also, the quality of the instrument is remarkably different. And I, I can tell you that honestly because I've used both. No one, no one allows you to use an instrument for 90 days, and if you don't like it, return it. Um, they're, they're US made, they're high quality, and they're not uh, cheap imitation, so to speak. Okay. Talk a little bit about how you deal with um, teeth that, that aren't budging, and maybe we're, we're seeing some, some buckle plate fractures. You know, a typical example maybe would be like a number four on an older patient, and you know, the thing just won't budge. Uh, you know, you, um, you're doing the lingual ledging, you're doing good purchase points, but you know, eventually you're just snapping that, that buckle plate. Is, that, is it that technique sensitive, or is there something else that would probably cause something like that? Yeah, it's not so much. Um, it's not so much um, um, the, the tooth itself. If, there, if there's a periodontal ligament, the, the instrument will will move again, but it may take more time. And unfortunately, Lauren, as, as dentists, we, we have a tendency to be non-patient, and to, to hold an instrument for four minutes on a tooth is a lifetime for a dentist. And so we have a tendency to be impatient and squeeze the instrument and try to use the physics force up like a conventional force up. It, it is not a conventional force up. So if we're fracturing facial bone, and, and have, I, have I damaged facial bone? Of course I have, you know, because I can be as impatient as anybody. But if we're doing it routinely, as, as you were inferring there, then we're not using the instrument correctly. And I think that's where a live demonstration uh, course, like our level one, where you're going to see 20 patients and remove just a, a, a boatload of, of, of teeth uh, on difficult patients, um, uh, on, on difficult situations, uh, is, is quite, a, quite an experience. So I think that, that the technique is very, very important. Uh, it's not that I, I never break facial bone, but it's pretty rare. Um, if, you, if you find that you have a tooth that just isn't budging, um, you can certainly go back to the more conventional taking an elevator and see if you can loosen it a little bit or, or creating some, some space between the, the root of the tooth and the bone to try to elevate it a little bit more. Remember, too, that ligaments are not rubber bands. They don't bend back. So how many times have, have, have we tried to remove a tooth? You get frustrated. You're sweating. Your armpits are sweating. You just, you just got to get up. You, you walk away. You make a phone call. You get a cup of coffee. You come back, and all of a sudden, the tooth pops out. Well, the process is continual. It, it doesn't, the tooth doesn't tighten up over a period of time. It will continue. That enzymatic action will continue, and then the tooth will, will be able to be removed. A lot of it is impatience. I, I've seen a lot of students now. We've, we've taught this course for many years, and most, most of it is muscle memory. We want to squeeze. We want to use it like a conventional forcep, and we have to train ourselves to realize that it's not a conventional forcep, and we have to follow the the technique that that Dr. Golden created so brilliantly, right? And I, you know, sort of following up from that, I mean, you know, and there's a number of people that comment on this. And when you actually look at the technique and you look at the the images, it it seems like it should be causing that buckle plate to break more often. I mean, if you could could realistically, you know, look back at your numbers, I mean, what percentage of the cases are are you seeing those buckle plate fractures? One percent, one out of one. Really, not low. Two out of a hundred. Very rare, yeah. And and it's difficult when we're showing slides. I, mean, I wish we could show them in three dimensions. If and if Kurt would uh, would pay up a little bit, maybe we can do some three D glass glass programs. Send them out before we do these webinars. Um, the the teeth are actually coming out of the socket. They're not coming facial. Now, do we do we do we bend the facial bone to some degree? Of course, but that that's part of the extraction process. But the te the teeth are actually coming out of the socket also, occlusally or incisally. Yeah, Laura, I think the two biggest misconceptions are, you know, the name of it's a forcep. So people believe they're going to squeeze, and then also people don't realize, I guess, unless they get a proper explanation, that you only move the tooth, you know, a, a couple millimeters until it disengages. So you don't continue to go out, 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 and out with the tooth, you know, expanding, um, the lingual or the facial bone with it. Um, it's only designed to kind of pop or release the tooth. It, all it really is is a fancy lingual elevator. So if you treat it like a fancy lingual elevator and don't squeeze like Tim said and just move the tooth slightly, um, you know, you're, you're not going to break bone. Yeah. And will it 
happen every once in a while, sure. But it happens with anything. Uh, Kurt, what about the bumpers? Are, are they reusable or is it just one per patient? I, I don't reuse them. Kurt could probably address that. Um, you know, they're, they're very inexpensive. and we, we just throw them out. Um, Kurt, maybe you can, you can address that, how, how they were. The company policy, we say they're disposable. I mean, the, most people throw them away. We sell a bunch of them. But they're, they're inexpensive, like Tim said. I know some doctors will autoclave them a couple times, um, which is fine. Um, you know, they will go through the autoclave. They're, they're silicone, latex-free bumpers. Um, you know, after a while, they'll, they'll start to break down or discolor. Um, but however, like I said, it's nice and convenient just to have them in the blister-type pack that they come in and have them sitting in the operatory. They're clean and sitting ready to go. Um, so I guess, you know, that's up to the, uh, the doctor to make that choice. But as a you know, company suggestion, I guess we just recommend they're disposable. What's the approximate cost per bumper? I mean, if someone were, were obviously depends. Like, it's like 40 cents. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not like 10 bucks. They, uh, they, uh, you know, also, too, if somebody wants even some additional padding, some doctors will take a a two by two, even a full and half, and um, also get some additional cushioning under the bumper. Yeah. Um, Tim, are you finding any issues with insurance paying for extraction and grafting if it's done on the same day? Um, you know, in, in, <laughs> insurance is a tough. It's a tough animal. Um, I, I think extractions are extractions, um, whether they be um, simple or, or surgical. If you take a if you take a burr to bone, it's surgical. Um, mo most insurance companies, in, in our experience, are not covering the cost of graft. Now, this is a very important part to, to discuss, Lauren, and I'm glad you brought it up because I think grafting is is a very essential part of dentistry today. Um, I, I hate the word standard of care, but but I think uh, we could consider it to be a standard of care. Uh, and then if you don't provide it, if you don't uh, explain it to your patients and make it an option, that, that could be a, a problem down the road. Now, the, the issue then becomes the expense. You know, patients are aware, uh, they can understand that when we remove a tooth, bone is going to shrink. If bone shrinks, it may not be possible to, to do the type of aesthetic work that, that we'd like to do, either immediately or in the future. Um, so placing a graft is an important part uh, of the process. Now, how do we charge for that? Well, when you work with a company like, like Golden Dental that provides you outstanding product, I mean, high qual highest quality product at, at a very, very reasonable fee, you're not overpaying for the material themselves, then it allows you to provide the, the procedure to your patients in a very cost-effective manner. Um, it, it, the, the process, if, if it's a traumatic, is, is a matter of minutes to do. So it's not something that has to be excessively expensive to our patients and yet can be very financially rewarding for the dentist who learns the technique um, properly and learns to manipulate the materials properly. So, you know, you save on the, on the front end by working with somebody like Golden Dental and you, you learn the techniques to be efficient and proficient at what you do. Uh, it, it's it's a very rewarding, in a lot of ways, procedure for your patients. Yeah. Now we did have a couple of questions about the um, the quantity of, of material. I mean, people are trying to figure out how many cc's of allograft to put in the molar and premolar. And when when they have the syringes, is, is it pre measured or you know how is that typically handled? Can they can you reuse it or you know what's how is that the, that process work? Well, the the, the answer is basically no. In, in a, a molar. Is, is about a cc, and, and you can buy product, and, and, and Kurt could probably address this better than I can, in, in, a, in, a, in a lot of different um, 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 sizes or amounts that you want. I normally buy in one cc um, or, or a half a cc. A half a cc is really good for like a bicuspid tooth. Um, so I get in the habit of buying um, half cc or one cc vials um, or one cc um, uh, putty, um, putty uh, syringes, which is which is adequate for one tooth. Now, if you find that you're going to do a full mouth extraction and graft ten sites, then maybe you want to get a five cc um, syringe of material, which obviously when you buy in bulk, it's less expensive. 
Yeah. Now I think when you That's showed. A great question. I don't know if we've yeah. had that one before. That's a good question. Yeah. Now when when you showed that syringe, it looked like it was kind of like an offset cut. There. Did you do that, or is that how it comes? Uh, I don't think it was off. It just looked that way. I think. Okay. I think it's just straight across. Yeah. So you didn't do any cutting at the end of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Not. That. The right answer. That, that there's a cap on the end of that one, and since um, that's the crunch putty, which has uh, cortical cancellous like chips in it, so there's um, different particle sizes that you know, couldn't be squeezed through a really fine tipped uh, syringe. So it, it's cut like that on the end. Um, it's not something that Tim did. It, you pop the cap off and it, it's packaged like that in, in like a one cc size. And um, you know, like Tim said, you're just going to squirt it out of the socket into the, to the socket side. So it's not cut like that. That's how it comes. The cap pops off and it looks just like that. Yeah. Um Tim, I, I don't want to make sure I, I phrase this question correctly, so don't get into trouble with uh, you know, our legal department here. Um, for someone in the Detroit area who has your level of expertise, what would <laughs> that person typically charge for an extraction, uh, you know, and bone grafting uh, with or without a membrane? Um, you know, our, our our membranes, and I, to be honest, I'm not even sure. I, I think extraction fees are are pretty consistent across the board, 100 to 200 dollars. I, I, I'm not even sure, depending on, on what, what type you're doing. In a, in a grafting, I think you can, you know, if you can buy the material for, for 100 dollars, Warren, I mean, what, what's a fair price? You know, is 300 dollars enough, 400, 500? I, I think ours are, are 495 if, I, if I'm correct, but it, it's because I do it routinely. I mean, it's just, cause that, I'm preparing for implants all the time. So I want to make it. I don't want to make it cost prohibitive for our patients. I, I'd rather that they spend their money on on the things that are really important to me, and it makes my dentistry that much better. Okay. Whether it be a, a bridge project or an implant, it just makes my dentistry that much better. Now let's let's talk about implant because I think there was a, a one of the cases that you showed. You were putting some graft material into a, a cuspid site before putting an immediate implant in. Wouldn't that um, having that bone graft material kind of prevent complete seeding of the implant? No, it just threads. It, it threads right into it. Okay, so we're just getting. So, you know, our implants today are very aggressive. The thread that was an implant direct. They have to be an implant direct. But most of our implants are very aggressive. They have aggressive. They're self-tapping, so it just taps right into that material. Yeah. When you are about to um, place a graft, are you doing any type of flushing? Are you doing like some saline rinse or something into the socket before you put the graft? Great, great questions today. We got a great audience. Huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll. My rule is, and I tell people to write this down, correct, 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 correct. I stop, correct, 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 correct. We have to clean the site. You can, you can rinse it with, with uh, sterile saline, sterile water. You know, sterile saline is like, like cocaine today. It's hard to find. But, um, yeah, we can get But what you never want to do is you never want to inject a socket site with chlorhexidine because you will kill the osteoclast and osteoblast um, and, and, and prohibit their activity. So never use chlorhexidine in a socket site. Okay. Now, on, on the subject of saline, what about those resorbable membranes? Would you tend to moisten those when, in saline before you I use do. them? I, I, I soak them, yeah. I soak them so they're, 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 they're pliable, yes. For, for someone that hasn't used these membranes before, how are they prepared for the extraction site? Are they already cut to a specific dimension, or does it come into a sheet that you customize? What, they're, at least they're, sheet, you use? they're a sheet of different sizes, and what I'll do is I will simply... Um, Depending on the the design of the socket site, I will cut it accordingly. Oftentimes, what I'll do is I'll take a sheet and I'll cut it in half, and and use one half the sheet and sterilize the other half, and um, and go ahead and, and and cut it to appropriate shape, whether it be an hourglass or a trapezoid or whatever whatever shape needs to to fill that socket. Okay. Now, just a follow up from your your comment about chlorhexidine. Do you say you don't use it when you're grafting, or that you never use it? I know I have them rinsed beforehand. Their their mouth is rinsed, but you don't inject into a socket site. Got it. You do not irrigate chlorhexidine into a socket site. Okay. What about um, antibiotics? If someone's got a bone graft, are you routinely prescribing antibiotics afterwards? Yeah, antibiotics are a funny thing, you know, Lauren, and, and, and when you were practicing in, in, in years ago when I practiced, we probably gave a lot more antibiotics than, yeah. than we do today. Um, you know, I'm giving very low doses. We're finding that, that the um, infection just doesn't happen anymore. It just, it's, it's just so rare. 
Um, so I will give a low dose of antibiotic. If, if possible, I'd like to start a, a day before. But I'll, I'll give 250 amoxicillin three times a day for three days, you know, a day before and two days after, and that's plenty. Um, and we just don't see issues um, like we, well, I don't know if we ever did. I guess we were more preventive oriented. Um, uh, but we've really cut down, and, and as far as pain medications, it's, it's ibuprofen almost across the board. You know, it's very rare that we would give a narcotic like narco or something like that. And everybody's pain thresholds are different, obviously, but um, we don't give nearly the narcotic that we used to. Okay. If you, you know, if you were placing a bone graft and you had your choice of uh, cortical or cancellous, uh, you know, are you using a combination of them, mineralized, non-mineralized? I mean, what's the ideal for you? Great, great question. So cortical means it's from the, the, the hard bone. It's hard pieces. Cancellous is like medullary bone. Um, uh, demineralized, meaning that they, they, they um, uh, process the, the um, particles uh, in, in, in some kind of acid. And you can demineralize cortical bone, but you can't demineralize cancellous bone because it, it's eaten away. It'll be gone. So what we normally, what I like to use is a combination. Demineralized cortical, mineralized cancellous. Why do I do that? Well, they absorb at different rates. So the osteoclasts are going to eat away the cancellous bone much quicker than it will the cortical bone. And when you have a, a, a stepwise progression of, of, um, of the bone being eaten away and new bone laid down, we get a better, better, more thorough result. That's why we don't crush material so that they're all the same particle size. They're all the same particle size, and the resorption occurs all at the same time. And we don't want that. We want the, the resorption to occur over, over a period of months. OK. Now, you know, a lot of the teeth that people are probably taking out have some active infections. Would that change your treatment plan at all? Would it compromise the success of grafting if there's an active infection? And if so, is there something you would do to, you know, to try to increase the, the likelihood of success? Okay, if a tooth is infected, meaning, uh, what, well, what does that mean? Oftentimes we can remove a tooth and remove the granulation or cyst all at the same time. Uh, if we have purulence, if we have pus in the socket, we curette, it, curette the tissue out. I have no problem at that point, um, Lauren, putting in a graft material. However, I will not put an immediate implant in a site like that. I will go graft and let it heal. And you know, I like to use the analogy. I'll use it with my patients a lot, too. It's like a hangnail. Have you ever had a hangnail? Hangnails can be miserable. I mean, they can be excruciating, painful. It can ruin a vacation. It can ruin a, a whole day for you. So what do you do when you have a hangnail? You, you soak your foot, you cut the nail, and within five minutes you forgot that you ever had a problem. And the body is an amazing thing, and that's what happens with, with the body. The, 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 the body responds and will correct the problem very, very efficiently. If there's infection, obviously they're on antibiotic, and, and we take it from there. But um, it, it, I would not put an implant in, a, in an infected, truly infected area, but I would grasp. I do grasp. Okay. Um, we only got about two or three minutes left, and I, I know we're not going to go to the questions here. Are there any contraindications to using the physics forces? Are there certain cases you'd look at, you know, curved roots, uh, third molars that you say, eh, I'm not going to bother with this, uh, or you, can you use them pretty much anywhere? No, Lauren, I, I think you can use them pretty much anywhere. I think the, the important considerations to make are, number one, you have to look at the density of bone. You know, um, a, a, a white uh, female, a tiny female versus a a large um, African-American, um, obviously the root structure and the bone structure is different. Um, look at the div divergence of roots. If, if the roots are very divergent, as I showed, section the tooth, take it out by two bicuspids. Uh, mandibular teeth are more difficult to remove than maxillary teeth. Maxillary teeth have more medullary bone. Uh, be conscious of the, of the uh, cu cuspid eminence. The anterior teeth can be difficult to remove because the bone can be very, very thin. So take your time, relax, use the instrument as it was intended to be used, and don't squeeze. Yeah. Well, I want to be respectful of people's time. I, I do apologize we couldn't get to all the questions. I, I think the, the only solution here is to do another webinar, Tim, because um, there was a lot of great information. I, we can sort of keep some of these questions from, from last time and, uh, and carry them over to, to the next webinar. But just, 
Now, I've had the pleasure of hearing you speak uh, multiple times, and uh, I'm always learning something new. Uh, you've always, you're always bringing in new cases and new information, and um, just want to thank you so much for sharing your, your time and expertise with us this evening. Thank you, Lauren. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoy you. Great questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we did have some really great questions here. We know your time is valuable. We want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Um, as, as Kern had mentioned, this uh, promotional code, the Web 10, uh, the 10% on everything is just a, it's a huge savings. It's not something that they do on a regular basis, if ever. I don't think I've ever seen that type of special. Normally, the special is usually only good for a day or so. They're actually going to extend it through the end of the week. So I would highly encourage you that if you're thinking about getting involved with Physics Forceps or want to take some of the courses, um, you know, go onto their website. When you log out tonight, if you just want to get more information about the courses or just want someone from Physics Forceps to contact you, just indicate that. Uh, you know, you can, if you want to speak with me, that's great. Uh, you can say that as well. But certainly, if you have any interest in having someone from Physics Forceps contact you, just indicate when you log out, uh, and they will make sure someone follows up with you as well. As I mentioned, uh, we do have continuing education uh, available, credits available. Physics Forceps will send that out. It does take a few weeks, so, so please be patient. Uh, we do these regular these regular webinars uh, pretty frequently. Uh, many of you know uh, and, and get invitations for upcoming webinars. Uh, tomorrow night, actually, we've got Dr. Erin Elliott uh, from the DC uh, Dental uh, Webinar Series. She's presenting her final uh, webinar on sleep apnea. That's been a great series. Uh, the day after that, uh, Tony Feck will be talking about short-term ortho. Uh, we've got a new, um, a new topic coming up on Thursday from Referral IM. It's a new great service for people that have always had frustrations with uh, patients that are referred to a specialist and they never show up there. Uh, so that would be a good one to, to attend as well. So uh, we thank uh, Kurt and Golden Dental Solutions, uh, Physics Forceps, for sponsoring tonight's webinar. Uh, always great information. And uh, I will certainly make sure that, that those of you who uh, want to get a follow-up from them uh, get that information sent to you. We thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, thank you, uh, Tim. And we look forward to seeing you all on future webinars. Good night, everyone. Super. Good night.